The island of Sodor was in the grips of winter. It had come earlier than expected, and with it came the fog. None of the engines liked fog. Long periods of fog and mist would bring about old ghost stories and superstitions amongst engines both large and small. Several weeks had passed since the twins' experience at Balahu Manor, but they were still rather shaken by the events. And the small railway engines would notice this when either Donald or Douglas came to collect ballast. It is strange, said Bert. Donald and Douglas are two of the bravest engines we've ever known. Whatever it was, added Jock, it must have scared them good. Some day later, Rex had taken some empty trucks up to the ballast mines. The sun was setting and the fog began to settle. He was almost at the mine when he heard the faint sound of an engine's whistle. That's odd. When I left, all of the others were stable in the shed. The small controller must have sent one of them out on an emergency task. Rex said to himself. The whistle was unfamiliar, but it was so faint that he couldn't tell. He soon arrived at the mine and shunted the trucks into a siding. He then puffed onto the turntable and was turned around for the journey home. It was getting dark. Rex soon reached the forest. Rex grew confused. He thought he could hear the sound of an engine's pistons pounding, which wasn't his own. The sound was getting louder and louder, and without warning, a gust of wind brushed past the little green engine, and then the sound disappeared. What was that? Rex asked his driver. I'm not sure, old chap, but it must have been good. When Rex returned to the shed, he told the engines of his experience. I just heard the noises of a steam engine coming towards me, and the gust of wind blew right through me, almost knocking me off the rails. Come now, Rex, chortled Mike. It's just your imagination working all the time. You were so taken in with Donald and Douglas's encounter, it has tricked your mind into experiencing one of your own. Rex glared crossly at Mike, and before an argument could break out, Bert stepped in. It's not as far-fetched as you may think, Mike. Oh, not you too. What did they do to you when you got overhauled? Scoffed the little red engine. Do you remember Duke, the engine we helped rescue all those years ago? Well, while I was away being overhauled, he too was also in for repairs, and he told me about the legend which our railway has possessed. What legend? asked the engines together. An engine that ran on the old mid sodor still haunts our line. Mike burst out with laughter. That Duke is a very old engine and probably very soft in the small box. When hearing the story it might be good for laugh. Bert sneered at Mike and began his story. In the early days of the Mid-Sodor Railway, Duke was the only engine to operate the main line, while the others were restricted to the mines and quarries. Duke handled both freight and passenger services on the main. He enjoyed the peace and quiet and never complained, but the manager felt Duke needed help. So he went to speak with the old engine. Now I know you don't mind hard work, Duke, said the manager, but I and the rest of the board feel that you need a helping buffer with the good services. So we've acquired a saddle tank locomotive from the Falcon Workers at Loughborough. 
He should be arriving tomorrow. Yes, sir," said Duke Daffodil. He had deep feeling in his firebox that this engine would be difficult. And he was right. The engine was called Albert. On his first day, the manager had assigned him to take some empty trucks to the quarry. Albert was not happy with this. I'm supposed to haul those rusty planks," snorted Albert, as he and Duke shunted them behind the saddle tank. Indeed, you are a youngster," snarled Duke. "The best way you will have a good life on this line is to obey instructions." And who was an old fuddy-duddy like you to give orders? Retorted Albert, and he roughly pulled the trucks out of the yard. Albert's behaviour continued in this fashion, and would ultimately bring about his grim demise. Many months later, blasting was to take place at the mines. Albert was rusted to take the train of gunpowder and explosives. Duke warned him to be careful. You are carrying lethal cargo, warned Duke. One stupid move and you will be blown sky high. Albert just laughed. I will handle the train my way. I don't have to take advice from you. And Albert steamed away. Duke watched anxiously as he pulled out of the station. Duke had a sinking feeling in the firebox. This would be the last time he would see Albert in one piece. Albert was rough with the trucks, and as a result, they swayed violently as he swaggered along the line. The driver and fireman grew worried. He is rough riding again. Anyone would think he was in control, and not us," said the driver. Albert laughed loudly. "Stupid old engine! Stupid old engine!" he puffed. His luck was about to run out. As he entered the mine. He gave the trucks a violent bump. This caused the first truck to explode, setting up a chain reaction to the rest of the train. Duke was far away at Arsdale, but the explosion was so powerful it almost shook the entire valley. Soon the manager came running urgently up. There's been a fatal accident at the mine. Announced the manager, "Please take a crane to remove the remains of the engine immediately." The driver spoke to the manager. "What are the casualties, sir?" he asked. "The crew and four workmen were killed in the explosion," answered the manager solemnly. Duke took a deep, mournful breath and went about his grim task. He was coupled to the breakdown crane and clanked to the mine. When he arrived, the scene was an awful one. Ambulances had arrived to take the casualties away, and on the line ahead of him, Duke could see the charred remains of Albert. I warned him," said Duke, but he wouldn't listen. The small railway engines gasped in shock. What happened then? asked Jock. Bert sighed deeply and continued his story. The men killed in the blast were laid to rest in a nearby cemetery, and what was left of Albert was cut up for scrap. Months had passed and life started returning to normal, but sometimes 
the sound of a whistle wailing in the distance could be heard. It is said that Albert's spirit still haunts the line leading up to the mines. The small railway engines were in awe of Bert's story. It must have been Albert that I heard near the mines, said Rex. But Mike was not convinced. That story was good for a laugh, he snorted. Ghost indeed. I could spend an entire night at the ballast mines, and I wouldn't see or hear a thing. The only things up there that would go bump in the night is a stray truck. You never know, said Bert. The next day the small engines were once again busy taking passengers up the valley and collect ballast to be transferred to Donald and Douglas's trucks. Mike and Frank were working at the ballast mines, shunting trucks into place for Rex to take to the chute at Alsberg. What rubbish that Bert goes on with, shouted Mike, as he pushed the line of empty trucks to the shaft. There may be ghosts on the big railway, but not here. Frank remained quiet. He knew that if he had said something, he would be dragged into a never-ending debate with the haughty red engine. Later that day, Jock had broken down at the bottom station. train, leaving Mike at the ballast mine on his own. Where are you, Albert? said Mike sarcastically. Show yourself. The sun was setting and it was time for Mike to return to the shed. But there was a problem. As the workmen went to change the points, the lever would not budge. The point lever is stuck fast, the workman reported to the foreman. I'll phone for a maintenance crew to come here right away. But soon he returned from his office frowning. No one can be sent up here until the morning, so Mike will have to spend the night in the siding. Mike gulped as he watched his driver and workman leave the site on Bert's train. The mist began to rise as Mike dozed in the siding. Ghosts. Ha! <laughs> he said to himself. Those lots will believe anything. Then Mike heard something. It sounded like a group of men talking amongst themselves. The fog was so thick, he couldn't see where it was coming from. Must be the night shift, he muttered, and closed his eyes. Suddenly he woke with a start. The sound of a steam engine's pistons could be heard in the distance, accompanied by a desperate whistle. N no it c can't be, stammered Mike. As the noise got louder and louder, and then to the red engine's horror, the mist clear to reveal the ghostly appearance of a blue saddle tank engine. Mike froze in fright as the spectra stared coldly at him. And then with a sudden blast of its whistle, the engine disappeared, followed by the sound of a massive explosion. No! wailed Mike. It can't be true! He closed his eyes tightly and remained that way for the rest of the night. Next morning when the points were mended, Mike returned to the shed. He was still in shock and when he backed into the shed, the engines couldn't help but notice. Hello Mike, grinned Jock. How was your night out? 
Mike didn't answer. He had heard that what he had witnessed was all a bad dream. But try as he might, he couldn't deny that he had had an encounter with Albert's ghost. Thank you.